Hello, everyone. As promised, here's a lecture about Japan. Poor Section A did not get to see this, so I'm mostly doing it for you guys, but everybody else can watch and enjoy if they want. So Japan is a little different than what happened elsewhere, and that's one of the reasons that we study it last. The response of, and how it unfolds in, in Japan, how the, West, how the Japanese respond to the intrusive Westerners is, is quite different, and uh, you'll see that. You did a homework assignment last week, so you know a little bit about the backstory. how in the 1850s the U.S. president sent a naval officer over to Japan on an expedition with the goal, the main goal, of getting a trade agreement. He brought with him a couple of letters. You wrote responses to those letters. You read them and, and responded to them last weekend. But the letters basically asked for four things, as you recall. They, they, they asked for peace and friendship. They asked for a trade agreement. They asked for safe harbor for ship, shipwrecked sailors. And they asked for a coaling and provisioning station in Japan uh, for the ships that crossed that made that long voyage across the Pacific. And the letters were written in that friendly, sort of, sort of friendly diplomatic tone. Perry's wasn't so friendly. But there was no mistake. This was a threat. They were told that if they did not comply, if they did not do what the Americans were asking, that they would, they would face war. In fact, Fillmore brought warships with him into the harbor that, uh, that he entered, which was in what's now Tokyo, then Edo. And in his letter, he indicated that more warships could soon come and would if the Japanese did not do the right thing. Here's a picture of Matthew Perry. Hi, Matthew Perry. And I want to point out those things on his shoulders with the little hanging doodads. Those are called epaulets, and they're very common in military dress uniform, and you'll see those later on in the show as well, in this slideshow. So anyway, there the Japanese are. Here's a picture. Here's two pictures, actually, from two different points of view. On the top is a, a, a picture that was drawn by an American artist who was on the expedition with Perry. He was actually brought in order to capture the, to record and document the expedition with this kind of artwork. And uh, on the bottom is the point of view of the Japanese. So take a look at these two, these two images. On the top, the American point of view, the most prominent feature is the people who were standing rather calmly on the shore. Uh, they look rather peaceful, maybe curious. Some of them are boarding some boats. They're heading out for a greeting. And way in the background you can see these these two two of the four ships that Perry had brought with him. By far this image is a lot more benign than the or it makes the, the, the setting the action is a lot more benign than what's going on in the one on the bottom, which is a Japanese artist's point of view. And in this one, you see all four ships, and they're lined up there on the right, and they're facing directly the shore. And on the shore, there are people who are lined up and facing directly the ships. The overall image is much more confrontational, which is basically how the Japanese felt. Jap Japan, as you also hopefully remember from the homework last week, was a completely closed society. They had a little bit of contact with the outside of with the world outside of Japan because they had trading. They traded with the Dutch, but not a whole lot, and only in one port in the south. So it was a closed society. They didn't want foreigners there. They didn't want foreign influences, foreign ideas. They were like China was before the Opium Wars, and. Um, Perry's arrival here was not, you know, wasn't really welcome. In fact, it was illegal for him to be in that harbor, but there he was. And not surprisingly, he was not viewed very favorably. These are some pictures of him. And there are those epaulets. You see them on the pictures. All three of them actually have his little shoulder decorations. And here is an even less flattering picture of Perry. True portrait of Commodore Perry, the envoy of the Republic of North America, which is what the artist called the USA. So there he is with his warships. The Japanese government is faced with this, this question of what they're going to do. 
and they have to do something. It took a little while. Perry showed up in the harbor. They finally, after a little while, I think it took a couple weeks, he found somebody to take the letters to the emperor of Japan, which he did. And, and then the, the, the two sides had a couple of encounters, meetings. On the left, on the bottom, you can see they had a big, like, dinner party on board the ship that Perry was himself was on, which was the Powhatan. And that's what's going on there on the left is the, the, the fancy get-together dinner that they had. And on the right, they had another get-together. There were gift exchanges. They brought, the Americans brought quite a few things from America. The Japanese gave the Americans some things. That's what was common then and still is common now, actually, this kind of gift-giving thing. So the Americans brought some whiskey. <laughs> they brought some pistols. They brought a miniature railroad, which you can see there on the right. They brought some telegraph wire. And the Japanese gave the Americans some silk and some porcelain tea sets and some umbrellas and some soy sauce. So they had this kind of nice diplomatic exchange there while Perry's waiting for the response of the Japanese government to his letters. And what are the choices open to the Japanese government at this point? Well, well, you say, I don't know. What are they going to do? Well, they could r refuse all four things. They could say, sorry, get out of our bay. You're breaking the law. Who do you think you are? But they didn't do that because they knew what had happened to China in the Opium Wars. And you mm -hmm. recall that, that China could not, could not fight against the technological superiority of the British. And it ended with the uh, Treaty of Nanking, the unequal treaty there. They could say, well, we'll give you some of this, but we won't give you all of these things that you're asking for. Or they could say, okay, we'll give you everything. Or they could say something else. They could say, well, we don't know. Give us a little time and we'll figure it out. And what they actually did was something kind of like those, kind of like a mixture of those responses. The first thing they said was, um, We'll give you, well, the first thing they said was, we'll give you three of the four things. We'll give you friendship, we'll give you coaling station, we'll give you a uh, safe harbor for your shipwrecked sailors, but we're not really ready to give you trade. This is against ancient law. We have um, recently undergone some problems. Our emperor just died. We're in a period of transition. We can't really just go and break these laws. We have to sort through some things before we make such a great decision. So uh, get back to us. We have to think about it. So they tried to stall, and Perry, sitting out in his boat in the middle of the harbor, says, wrong answer, wrong answer. He's out in his boat, he gets the letter, the letter says, we're not going to give you a trade agreement right now, and he writes another letter back, and he says, that's not good enough. Basically, I'm disappointed, my president's going to be disappointed, I'm going to send for more warships with stronger instructions if you don't do the right thing. And that's basically what happened. So the Japanese end up getting their own unequal treaty, the Treaty of Kanagawa. But they didn't just agree with the Americans in this case. They decided that they were going to try to not only give them a trade agreement, but they decided that they were going to try to embrace the ideas that the Americans had. Some of their, um, not just the Americans, but all the Westerners. Like I said, they saw what had happened in China. They're sitting here facing these four warships and the imminent arrival of others. And so they said, what's going on here? How, how can we be that strong? What is going on that these Westerners are crawling all over the seas and, you know, pushing people around and telling them what to do? So the Japanese government decided that they were going to try to learn those ways, or at least the ones that worked for Japan. Now, this wasn't an easy decision. At the time, Japan, well, when Perry arrived, Japan was actually not ruled by the emperor, although he existed and, and had a, a title that was important. But it was a military dictatorship, pretty much. Well, it was a mil military rule of the shogun, who was the, the, the supreme commander, I guess you'd call him, of the samurai, the warrior class, which were also the political elite. It was a feudal society, Japanese society at the time, not unlike the feudal societies of Europe in some ways in an earlier era. And the, um, the samurai elite 
had within Japan a really big debate about what they should do. Should they embrace these Western ideas or should they stick to tradition? You might remember that the Chinese government and the leadership of China and, and also you know, just regular people had a similar kind of debate in China about what they should do when the Westerners started forcing themselves into China. And in China, the reform-minded people, the people who wanted to modernize, they did not succeed. They were unsuccessful, and it ended with the collapse of the Qing dynasty in 1911. In Japan, something different happened. They did have a, they had a civil war, the Boshin War, between the two sides, those who were reform-minded and wanted to um, modernize and, and, and kind of transform Japan, and the traditionalists who, who did not. And the reform-minded modernizers won. And that's when we get what we call the Meiji era in Japan. And I'll, uh, I'll show you um, how to spell that in just a minute. So, so, this, uh, so this new leadership, the reform-minded leadership in Japan, decides that they're going to totally embrace foreign ideas only, only the only in as much as they serve Japan's needs. They don't want to, quote, become Westerners. They just want to learn how they do things and try to figure out if they can do the same things and become power, powerful themselves. So how would they do this? Like, how would they actually go about learning these ideas? Are they going to, you know, Google? Ha ha. No, not really. They can't. They're not going to go to the library and check out books. They actually have to, fig you know, they have to, to go to the West or bring Westerners in. And that's what they did, which I'll get to, but I forgot about this step. The first thing they did was they they displaced the shogun and the shogunate, this whole, you know, historical, feudal, military elite that, that had been running Japan. And they, they re... What do I want to say here? They restored... That's what I want to say. They restored the power of the emperor. They installed a new guy whose name... Was, well, actually, let me explain what was going on in this slide first. What I want to show you here is on the left are the emperors of Japan who were the two emperors. The one on the bottom is Komei, and I can't remember the name of the one on the top. I'm so sorry. Anyway, these two emperors, th these two guys are the emperors of Japan prior to the arrival of the Americans. In fact, Komei was the emperor when Perry came, into, came to Japan. And this is, they're in traditional garb. This is how they dressed. This is what they look like. <clears throat> On the right, you see Napoleon Bonaparte from France. This is what he looked like. This is what the leadership looked like in, uh, in the West. And look, there are those epaulets again. And here's Napoleon's nephew. His name is Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon. He was the emperor of France when Perry got to Japan. So the reason I'm putting these images up here is because look at the difference between these two guys on the left and this guy on the right and how they're dressed. And now look at the new emperor of Japan after the arrival of the Americans. That's how he's dressed. And you can see that he looks a lot more like the Napoleons than he does like the two emperors on the left. So on the bottom you can see Meiji, M-E-I-J-I. -I. And Meiji means enlightened rule. You should remember that. Meiji means enlightened rule. It wasn't actually only this guy, the emperor, who was running Japan at the time. It was actually an oligarchy within the imperial court, which is a group. But uh, anyway, he became elevated to the position of stature and standing that, that emperors had had before the period of the shogunates. Okay. So the Meiji commanded that knowledge shall be sought through the world and thus shall be strengthened the foundation of imperial polity. That means the state. <clears throat> so they decided, like I said already, they're going to go around the world, they're going to bring the world to Japan, and they're going to figure out how to be strong like those folks who were kind of, you know, reaching all over the globe and pushing people around. They went to, so they sent a delegation, they sent delegations, more than one, they sent delegations to Europe, they sent them to America, uh, and when they came, and, and, and they came back and brought these new ideas about science, about industry, about technology, about education, about economics, and they started to reform. Here's a picture of one of those delegations, right? And you can see they, they look very traditional. 
When they came back, like I said, reforms were made. And what they did was they took the best of what they saw abroad and they created it for Japan. So, for instance, the Japanese army was based on the best army that they found, which was the Prussian army. The navy was based on the best navy that they found, which was the British. Here's a picture of Japanese warriors right before the Meiji Restoration. Restoration, that's, that's what they call the restoring of the emperor, which I mentioned earlier. So anyway, here are the, the, this is what the Japanese military looked like before. Now, check this out. You guys seen The Last Samurai there on the bottom? I saw that movie. It's okay. But anyway, it, that this this story that I'm telling you is the setting for that movie. And that, that movie is fiction, right? It's fiction. Tom Cruise or anybody like him never went to Japan like that. However, a guy did, a French guy. The story's based loosely on the story of a guy from France. Because what happened was, the, the not only did they send, like I said, delegations abroad, but they brought Europeans, they brought Westerners into Japan. And one of the things they did was they brought Westerners to train a new army. And that's what's going on in the top picture. And you also see that in the movie, The Last Samurai. So these are, this, these, are, these are Japanese troops who are being trained by French people who came to Japan to help them. So that by the time of this, this period is over, the, the Japanese military doesn't look like this anymore. Instead, it looks like that. Quite a difference. And here's another example of Western influence. On the left there is an imperial princess. She was married into the royal family and she's wearing Western garb, as you can see. And on the right is another delegation of, uh, of uh, Japanese leadership who went abroad. You can see the guy in the middle, Iwakura, is wearing traditional dress, but the others are wearing pretty typical Western-style dress, even those top hats. You see them in their laps? Another thing that the Japanese did was uh, completely transform their economy. They industrialized quite rapidly they began with textiles, as did the Europeans back in the 1700s. And, uh, and then they did all that other stuff, too. You remember at the beginning of this topic, I talked about the explosion of technological innovation that was happening in the West. And now it's going to Japan as well. Railroads and steel, mining, shipbuilding. All of these enterprises were started by the government, who heavily taxed the farmers of Japan in order to pay for it. And when it was profitable, they sold it to large corporations. Have you ever heard of Toyota? Toyota was one of those conglomerates. They were called Zaibatsu in Japanese, uh, but that's, that's where Toyota was born. And like they were in, in the West, the workers were oppressed and, and mistreated. That's unfortunately seems to be fairly common with industrialization. Like I said earlier, the goal was often, or almost always actually, to fulfill the needs of the state. Social reforms were implemented as well. New education system. They modernized the education system, bringing Europeans into Japan to help them start schools and colleges and universities. And they also sent thousands of Japanese abroad to go and study in the West and then to come back to Japan to teach. Like the French and other Europeans before them, one of the main goals of education reform was to strengthen the state by creating citizens who were smart, informed, competent, and above all, loyal. Remember in France, they taught anthems and language and culture and all of this. That's uh, one of the projects of nationalism. Speaking of nationalism, they also established a state religion. It was actually, they revived an ancient uh, tradition, Shinto, Shintoism, which is uniquely Japanese. It involves um, spirit worship. To be honest, I don't know tons about Shintoism, but at the time, many Japanese were Buddhist, and there were Buddhist temples throughout Japan. Those were outlawed. They were banned, and everybody was required to register at a Shinto temple. The goal of Shintoism as an official religion of the state was to create national unity, a cultural product that everyone could relate to. So by the end of the 19th century, the Japanese plan to modernize and industrialize had succeeded. And what did they do next?
What did they do next? I know that you're dying to know. Well, first they renegotiated the treaties that they had been forced to sign by the Western powers, those unequal treaties. And then they did what the Europeans did and the Americans. They embarked on their own imperial ventures. In 1894, they had a war against China and they beat China in six months. This was a huge deal. China was a great regional power at the time. Um, but as you know from the opium wars that had happened 50 years earlier, they were uh, having a lot of difficulty and really weakening. So the Japanese were able to defeat China, which was a big deal. They took a lot of money from China. They kicked them out of Korea. They took over Taiwan, and they also took over a little peninsula, the Laodong Peninsula. The Europeans and the Americans, but mostly the Europeans, were a little nervous about this growing Japanese strength. They supported uh, growing Japan. It displaced the power of China in the east, but they didn't want them to get too powerful, so they made them give the peninsula back. Here's a map that shows what I just described. There's Japan, and you see Korea, the long peninsula that's hanging out there in between China and Japan. The Chinese were kicked out of Korea, and the Japanese influence moved right on in. If you look over on the, 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 the map on the right, you see Korea there, and to the immediate west of Korea is a little peninsula. That's the Laodong Peninsula that the Europeans did not want Japan to keep. There's a lot of mineral resources in that part of the world, and the Japanese, the Chinese, the various Westerners who were in China, and the Russians competed for those resources. And so the Westerners wanted to sort of keep a little control of what Japan was up to. And that's a trend that's going to continue into the 20th century. Another big thing that happened in 1905 was that the Japanese declared war on Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, and they defeated them. They didn't get much out of this war. They received just a little bit of territory, but it was a huge old deal, a really big deal, major significance. Why? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it was the first time that an Asian nation had defeated a European power. Remember, the whole imperial project for the Europeans was about their uh, supremacy, about the superiority of their civilization. They were more advanced. They were, it, the social Darwinists said that it was, it was biological, that they were a race that was supposed to be on the top of the human pyramid. And that was uh, challenged and successfully by the Asian, by this Asian upstart country of Japan. It electrified all of Asia and it demonstrated that European colonialism and power was not necessarily a done deal. It gave hope to all non-white people, not just in Asia, but also in other parts of the world who were being pushed around by the Westerners. So, really big deal. And um, that's where I'm going to end. I hope that you have enjoyed my show, and good luck on the test.